Let, we're going to talk about, travel, about uh, uh, street photography. And I, I would like to uh, cover a couple of points before I show you any photos. Uh, you know, if you look at that, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an art form. A lot of people thought of it as snapshots, but it's an art form. And we owe our debt to Cartier-Bresson, people like William Klein, uh, things like that, uh, to capture the moments. And, and, and for all us photographers, it isn't even a question of, oh, they won't know you're being photographed. We, we uh, photograph people directly on. We photograph them when they're not looking. We ask them permission. We don't ask them permission. We do a lot of things. OK, so I'm just going to go through a few little items. My, the first item that I, I always think about is look normal. <laughs> Blend in with the crowd. You know, if you look like you're, you're uh, a fancy uh, uh, photographer, a socialite photographer, you're going to scare away most of your, your subjects. So you look, you look normal. Dress the way you would. Blend into the crowd. Um, I was going to show, I can't show it to you because it didn't get into the, uh, into the clip, uh, a picture that was taken by William Klein in the 80s on uh, Easter Sunday on Fifth Avenue, a picture of my friend Bruce Gilden and myself working the street. And you'd see what we looked like, schleppers, you know? We looked like schleppers. So that's one of the things. Look normal. Uh, there's another thing I have to tell you. Dress for the environment. You know, if you're, if you're going to a fancy place, dress fancy. If you're going to uh, a, uh, uh, a ghetto joint, look like you fit it in. Otherwise, people are not going to see you as, as somebody who is at one with them. They're not going to see you. They're going to see you as looking at them as an oddity. I think one of the reasons that you're successful in street photography is if you have a good feeling for who you're photographing. If you think you're photographing creatures, they're going to feel that, and you're going to see it in the photographs, I tell you. Simple equipment. Well, today, it's easy to say. Years ago, when I was shooting, I'd have three or four cameras around my neck. That was before my little stroke. and I'd. Uh, I'd uh, walk around, and uh, you'd have the cameras, uh, your meters, film, a bag of film. You remember the old day? You had to carry a lot of film. I once did an assignment in Suriname, in Dutch Guiana. I carried 300 rolls of film. I mean, it weighed a ton. OK, so today it's much easier to have simple equipment. I always think also um, big telephotos are overwhelming to the, to, the, to the subject that you're going to photograph. I usually use wide angle stuff, so the wider the better, which means that my lenses are not, they're compacted. And that's an idea to think about. You walk around with a, a Nikon with a, a big uh, telescopic lens, and anyway, you know, I have a photographer say, oh, I, I got this uh, 12,000 millimeter zoom. You can take a picture of a guy three miles away. <laughs> and I say, why would you want to do that? There's no connection. There's no contact. There's no human relationship between the photographer and the person you want to photograph. So that's not a good idea. OK. Um, you know, you used to say, don't run out of film. Well, in this day and age, memory cards, batteries, you know, you know, you think your battery's going to last forever. You know it's going to break down right at the time something incredible happens. So you always need another battery charged. I forgot to tell you, charged. <laughs> so that when you put it in, it's ready to go. All right. And a positive attitude. Now, I'm going to uh, speak a few minutes about model releases. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I just want to say model releases or like a bugaboo with most photographers. When you're on the street, model releases are really, I don't, I don't ask people to sign model releases. Uh, it changes the whole nature of the situation. 
the only time you should talk about model releases, the only time you should get a model release is if you are thinking that this picture is going to be used for trade or business. If there's anything like advertising in your mind, the possibility of it, anything having to do with the commercial use, you need a release. And you need a big release. If you do sign a release for a street person, um, I have some samples out oh, <coughs> on the table. You know, you can go into any stationery store or any camera store and buy those little index card releases. They're very short, but they're not short enough. You don't want anything in the release. Well, it's funny, they say more than they should and they say less than they should. At one point they say, I authorize you to use the photographs, copies of which I have exhibited to you. Oh, no, we're not, we're not going home and showing them the pictures that we took. No, they're going to give us a release. And the thing that most people leave out, they, and there's a signature line. Well, did you ever, let's say this is going to be used for a commercial purpose. Who did it? Well, I have a signed release. Who? Well, it's Flemish and Brief. <laughs> Who the hell? Is? There's got to be a line where they print their name, a telephone number, and today, an email address. If you're really thinking this is going to be a commercial matter, you have to get that information. Also, I think it's fair, now a lot of photographers don't do this, but I think it's fair to put in, if you really want to use it for a commercial purpose, to put a provision in that says, if this photograph is, uh, if, there's, if compensation is paid to the photographer for the use of the photograph, 25% goes to the model. No model, they're going to kiss you on both cheeks and they're going to sign it. But otherwise, you take advantage of them, and I don't think you should. Now, that's all I'm really going to say about, about model releases, because, frankly, Cartier-Bresson, shooting for the decisive moment, didn't run over and hand the person <laughs> jumping over that famous puddle a model release, you know? And neither did any of the other great photographers. So you don't need a model release as long as it is not used in trade or business. That's the law. I forgot to tell you, I'm also a lawyer. Uh, okay. Okay, let's... Uh, yeah, well, one way or the other. Okay. Now, I'm going to show you some pictures. I'll make comments, and I'll invite your, your questions and answers later. Now, I, I, uh, for a long time, I photographed parades. And what I stopped doing, this is an example of what I stopped doing, is I would stop taking pictures of the parade. Because you, once you get into a, a mode, the pictures tend to look alike. Sometimes they don't. This is one I thought was, was interesting. It's those, those uh, wonderful uh, masks. Uh, what I would do if I'm photographing parades, I go to either where it's starting up or where it ends. I like to see the dynamics of them suiting up, of getting ready, of kidding around, or at the end of the parade being tired. You get different imagery more than, because otherwise marching up and down Fifth Avenue, everybody can photograph that, right? Now, as a street photographer, I, was, I started to do work at the, uh, at the, uh, 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 Lower East Side Educational Alliance had a photo uh, institute, and I was in that uh, group for a, a couple of years in my early childhood. And one of the things was to go and take pictures on the street. Before that, as an early photographer, I took beautiful landscapes with uh, people in them as scale. You know, a big landscape and a little person down there. But when I got introduced to shooting on the street, that was the end of, of that. I, I learned a different, a different career. Uh, it's a wonderful thing. It's very, very uh, uh, meaningful. It's ad-living. As a trial lawyer, which I was, it had the same quality. You're cross-examining a witness. It's the kind of, you have to be on your toes. And I'm walking across Central Park in, in the fall, 
and I see this kind of pickup team, they're playing, and then for a second, they regroup, and, I, and there was a wonderful way the light was shining. I dragged out my camera, and you know, it was a very difficult photographic shot because of the differences in light. And what I did is I, I aimed the camera and the meter down at the shadows, so I shot for them. When I developed it, the negative, the sky was incredibly overexposed, because today it would be very easy to do, but I spent a lot of time burning and dodging and made a print. And that appears in a book called Cityscapes that Columbia University did some years ago. And uh, it, it, some of these are not technically street photographs, but I, I included them because I thought they were interesting in the spontaneity of them. This is at an old auto show at the Coliseum, the old Coliseum. And I like the fact, the way he was, you know, people position themselves in their own geometry. They're not even aware of it. And it's for the photographer to see and realize and enjoy that, that uh, serendipitous mixture of things. I like the way his head is lined up with that bar in the back. It's a very Mondrian look. And this was in a show on hands. <laughs> Uh, this is where I live on West End Avenue in front of the Greek Orthodox Church. And it, it was just a funny thing. You just have to be looking and you have to, that's another reason that one of the things that I didn't like about digital cameras is that there was a shutter delay. <laughs> I always look for, there gotta be practically no shutter delay because I wanna get it when I get it. And that was a perfect example of it. I like this one because it always reminded me of Diane Arbus's uh, picture of the youngster with the grenades in his hand, you know. He looks like he's going to be trouble when he grows up. <laughs> if he grows up. And you can see this is an old shot of Chinatown during the Chinese New Year because there's firecrackers all over the street. Now they're banned. But when I used to go down there, the first time I went there, I was deaf for about three days. <laughs> And then I realized I bought myself earplugs. And when I went back again the next year, I realized, and if you were a photographer, all the kids would throw the firecrackers at you, at your feet, etc. And the floor, the streets were covered with the red casings of the fire, fireworks. Now this, this is just around my corner. I just like, I walked by him, it was at, uh, on Broadway at 91st Street with a pan quotidian out on the sidewalk. And I just love the electric green uh, gloves that just popped out. And uh, he, he knew I was photographing him, but it, it, I thought it worked. Now this is another one of my illusory stories, you know. I love the women in this, in this old beauty parlor and the and the gorgeous ladies above them and them aiming for them you know it's uh, kind of sad but that's the way it is <laughs> and this is one of my one of my best portraits of uh, there was a three uh, three black children over in uh, Lincoln uh, over in uh, Union Square some years ago now here's my ultimate Easter parade shot he, he was amazing, and I shot, it, I shot it at an angle because I thought it needed some kind of mad look to it. Now, this is one of my, one of my vintage shots, but it's, I thought it was a nice, uh, I like the, the black and white uh, contrast patterns. And this was in a couple of shows. Uh, I call that... Uh, You know, the uh, rising from the ashes. The, uh, this, this was in uh, the uh, art of photography show in San, in San Diego some years ago. Uh, you can see it's an old shot uh, because it, it's summer, it's, it was a summer train. You see the wicker on the seats? Uh, yeah, well, no, that's, yeah. Uh, but it, it was, a, I think, the D tra it's the D train. Um, and uh, what I have done is, and this is something that I'm sure you do too, 
I have a cache of prints that go back to the 60s. Boxes and boxes and boxes of them. Every now and then I pull out a picture that I really like. I scan it. I put it onto my 3880 Epson printer. And I very, very slightly tweak it. And many times it's better than it was in the beginning, you know? Um, even though the, uh, the, uh, the, the paper and the light is different, et cetera. This is part of my Canal Street thing. You know, you, when is the next time you're gonna see a dog up out of the, you know? Now, it's funny because I had a show at Soho Photo Gallery, and that's White Street. You're walking towards the gallery and I was going to the show to uh, talk to, going to the gallery to talk to them. And I met this woman, I talked to her, I took the picture. I like, the edges of the picture are important to me. I like what happens. Sometimes it happens and you don't know it until after you print the picture. Without the man and his arm, it's not the same thing. But I thought also it was a good thing because there was a vector that would move you one place to another. And I made that print and I put that in the show, you know, but I, I never could get it to come to see it. it this is my yin and yang, you know. There's a stern face of the Marine vet and the beauty of the roses at, at the Soldiers and Sailors Monument on Veterans Day. Now, this is one of my favorite shots because it, it, as a photographer, it's black and white. And it has all of the tonalities. And the, the actual print is even more beautiful than this one. So I'm very proud of that one. Now, this is a kind of, this, this is not, a de, not exactly a street shot. <laughs> but I'll tell you how it came about. I have friends who are lawyers, and they had a law offices on Court Street in Brooklyn, and it was kind of run down, and they had it completely redecorated. It was beautiful. Walnut walls and brass doorknobs, and each one of the partner's wives decorated each office, and they had a big party. And I went to the party, and I got a little, and I thought, oh, I gotta go to the bathroom. Oh, he said, you go down the walnut line walls, to the oak door and the brass door, I mean, you go out and there's what? There's the original bathroom. They had never got to renovate the bathrooms. So there was this door, kind of a green door. It had a window in it with a, uh, the, uh, the, the chicken wire window and the sign said, gents. <laughs> and I opened it up. I couldn't believe what I saw. <laughs> so I, immediately ran out, went back, got my camera, which I had with me. And as I was coming back, another lawyer was going in and he saw me when I kind of ran out, he thought I was crazy. <laughs> but I was lucky, I had a wide angle lens. I leaned up against the sink and I took that shot. Now look at, look at what I did is I looked at, the, wall, at this, the floor. I could not find any indications that there had been any separations. Now, even in the army, <laughs> we will remember that the, that the latrines were side by side. Yeah. There were no, but you didn't have to look your fellow in the eye. <laughs> and then I did, for many years, I did my club work. I used to never go to sleep and run around in the clubs late at night. And uh, th that's actually a complicated picture, but I love the, uh, and it was used actually as a chapter over in a book on flash photography. What I used to do is I would have a flash on a remote cord and I would set it for a long shutter. So the flash stopped the main action and then the, sh then the long shutter gave me the movement of the background. So I did that a lot after a while First of all, you didn't know what you were going to get, but after all, you can start to anticipate it. Here's another one of my, my black and whites. This was at a, a party in Parsons. And if you look, and that's a polka, and lush lips remind me of Joan Crawford. 
but it's a guy in drag. <laughs> now, this is my historical picture. This was at the birthday of Bernice Abbott at ICP. And you see over there, uh, what's his name? And on the, on the left is a, a guy named uh, William. He's, he's, now the, uh, he's now the curator of a muse photo museum in Switzerland. So that was a nice, and those are her photos in the back. And all, this is a sample, very small sample of a series I've been doing for two years now on the bus. And I owe the series to the fact that I had a stroke and I couldn't carry a big camera, so I used the G10 and I just hold it around my belly and look in the screen and I have some amazing pictures. Now, if you know anyone who would like to have a book done on that, call me, will you? I gave this as an assignment to my students, like photograph something that you, that you see every day. And I, I, I got off the boat to the Staten Island, to the ferry, and you know, all of a sudden I realized, oh my God, look at that foot. And the people, so it was an interesting thing. And that was just on the fly, I was in a car in Staten Island. Now this picture has made me famous in my own way. Um, where do you think the picture was taken? Some of you may know. Was it taken in uh, the country? And uh, it was taken in New York City. It was taken out of my living room window. I live right on Riverside Drive and I'm on the ground floor. And one day I got up in early in the morning and I, it was a big snowstorm, obviously. I looked out my a big window, I have an old building big windows, I'm in my little jockey shorts, and I see coming up Riverside Drive, there's a hill, there's this figure in this black cloak, so I run for my camera. Now I go to shoot, but I, I never wash my windows, I gotta open up the windows, snow is coming in, I'm in my, I, that would have been a shot of me uh, <laughs> shooting that, and the figure comes up to that point and stays there for about 10 seconds, I shoot off one or two or three frames, and they leave. I never know who they are. I never see them. And the, tre and the picture, you can't duplicate. The, the tree on the left has been cut down by the park department for some ungodly reason. But since then, the picture was spotted in a, in a book on black and white photography by Macmillan of Australia. And they contacted me. They wanted to use it as the cover for a book called The Book Thief. And The Book Thief is about the Holocaust. It's a story told by a young girl, but it's told, it's, it's, told, it's narrated by the angel of death. So they liked that picture. So I sold them, but I, a, I sold them once, now listen folks, one time, single edition, paperback rights. That's all, English language, what did I know? The, the, the book becomes a bestseller in, on the New York Times bestseller list. They call, they email, all email from Sydney, Australia. We like, we need to make, we're making a second edition. So they have to come to me for, for permission. Okay, so now there's such a, so I say two things, I have to ask you, two things, I write two things. When I, when you guys worked out with me the deal, you showed me a, uh, a work uh, sheet and it was a front cover. When I got the sample of the book, it's a wraparound. Well, wraparounds cost more. So I never charge you for that. But now that you're in the big time, let me ask one question. What is the print run for the second edition? 20,000 copies. So I charged them a thousand bucks for the license for the first time. So I'm on my, t my typewriter, my computer, and I say, well, I'll have to charge more, uh, 1,500. I, I strike that out. 2,000. I don't know, I hit three by mistake. Three! I send them the thing for three. I don't hear from them for about a week or so. I get an email. Len, we love your work, and it's, you know, there's a lot of money, and we spend a lot of things. So we've had a board meeting, 
And the best we can do is $2,750. <laughs> I emailed email them back in bold type, sold. <laughs> and that's what happened. Well, it's not, I'll, I'll make it very fast. I mean, try, oh, I got plenty of time. <laughs> uh, what happens is the next year, the author's wife emails me and says, Mika loves the picture so much, and it's his birthday. Could, we buy, could I buy an original print? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Music to every photographer's ears. So I make a 20 by 30 print. I pack it in two tubes. I charge them 1,500 bucks and I send it off to Sydney, Australia. I get an email back. Oh, my husband and I love it. It's even better than it looked like on the, on the book. And we, it sends me a photograph of it framed and hanging in their home. Nice. Chapter four. <laughs> they license it to the French for the, in the French language. French publisher calls me up. We want to use your picture, fee. Sony, Sony of Sydney wants, makes an audio book out of it. A CD, same thing. Now, it's two, two years or so ago. Last year, I get my email. They don't see that somebody said, well, I want permission. I said, I just said Victoria. And they said, and he says back, who is Victoria? And I say to him, who the hell are you? <laughs> oh, he's in Bratislava. The, the uh, Macmillan has licensed the book for the, uh, uh, not Czech, what do you call that? Uh, Slovak. What's that? Slovak, Slovak language. So now I have to deal with, and the guy is a very young, the editor there, and now it's called, not, no longer called The Book Thief, it's translated, it's Knip. <laughs> and it's all, in, but it's the same book, right? So I, uh, we're dealing back and forth, and I, I, I don't know why, he's a very small press, and I don't charge him much, and it's taking a long time, and I say, I haven't heard from you for two weeks, and he, and he call, writes back, all on, all email. He writes back, and he says, oh, I'm very sorry, but I, I had to get, I got married, I had to go on my honeymoon. So I said, oh, well, that's a perfectly good excuse. That entitles you to a free original Spire photograph. So I email him three thumbnails of pictures I think he might like. One of them is that. The other one is the Volkswagen Bug that I showed you, and a third picture. He picks the Volkswagen Bug. I mail him a print. And months later, he says, I'm going to be in New York for the book fair. So I actually met him. We had dinner. It was great. Young guy, very nice. So photography has its. It uh, rewards. Of course, you have to go other places to street film photograph. This is my first real photograph. Now I'm going to give myself away. That is the uh, edge of the Imperial Palace. There's a moat there. And on the other side of the moat, on the other side of the moat, is the Daiichi building, if any of you have been in Tokyo, which is an insurance company of modern big building which housed Douglas MacArthur, the emperor of Japan in those days, right? He was the head. So he would come out and review everybody from the, right in front of the Imperial Palace. That was taken in 1946. I was in the army. I was in China in the 80s. And uh, uh, that's a street photograph, but it's in another place. This is a nice thing for me to remember because it was the day that the Bibliothèque Nationale accepted 20 of my photographs and I was walking home on air and I saw these kids playing in this little yard and I photographed them. This is at Venice. And you know, the, the juxtaposition of the text, of the text and the subject is what you have to train yourself for. <clears throat> that, that's in, uh, in Rome. She's a gypsy girl. I had to pay her mother a couple of something or other to let me take the picture. 
But I like the shoes and the shoe, you know, she'll probably never be able to buy those shoes. He had the battle of the ice cream cones in the Coliseum. Yeah, and that's grandpa and son. Like me, I'm a grandpa, I have a two-year-old son. You know? Now, I uh, did a, a series in, a, in Suriname, in Dutch Guiana. I uh, went down the Marawin River in a canoe in the jungle. Uh, we were working for the Suriname Travel Agency, and in the middle of our assignment, there was a coup, and the, and the travel agency disappeared. Uh, it was fun. But every year, uh, on the, when you went on this canoe thing with a little motor on it, uh, a, a canoe man and a, and a boatman and a guy with a pole with their piranhas in the water, uh, every day's journey, there's a, like a hostel where the traveler could stay. Usually, it's, it's in a, a deserted thing to stay away from the animals. So this was a little tiny island in the river, and there's a, a building, and they have a caretaker, and I think that was the, the wife of the caretaker. And that's one of my favorite uh, shots. It happens to be one of my favorite sons, too. But, uh. <laughs> and this is in Venice, in St. Mark's, very Italian. <laughs> So what you, you know, what you try to do is get the essence of what you're, there, what you're there for, because everybody's taking pictures, you know, and you want your pictures to be your own, your own idea. And while St. Mark's is always crowded and bustly with uh, people and waiters and stuff, I th thought when I saw him, it was early, it just looked uh, wonderful to me, you know, as a, an iconic thing. Now, when you first look at that, you think it might be Central Park, but it's Beijing in the winter. And that picture won, won me a first prize in uh, uh, an annual thing called, uh, um, I forget the name of it, <laughs> Reminiscences or something like that. Now, what I like to do and I've given this to my students in years past, and I do it myself all the time. If I find a place, it's like you close your eyes and you decide to photograph. I'm going to walk up Canal Street and photograph it. So here it is, 30 minutes. This is Tyrone. Let me introduce you to Tyrone. <laughs> Tyrone and I have become friends. I have another shot, which is not in this, of me and Tyrone with one of my, you know, one of those arm length shots. Now that's a, that's a Canal Street boutique. <laughs> you know, there's another thing. Photographers don't look up enough. We look down, we look straight, but we don't look up. Sometimes we find interesting things above our eye level. And then it's it's ti it's your timing. It's your it's, uh, you have to get into the rhythm of it. And there you go. Okay. Um, questions. What kind of camera lens do I use? These days, I'm using a small digital camera. I'm using the Canon G10. And uh, before that, I would use my, my, uh, my Leica CL or my Nikon uh, FT, FTN. And I, my lenses, what I use, I try to use lenses f uh, wider than 35, 28, 24. And I have an old Nikon 20 millimeter lens that's wonderful. So you're asking a question, you notice there's a tilt in the, in the pictures. Maybe it, my, one of my shoes is thicker than the other. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm not aware of that. And it, it just may be that um, 
I feel more comfortable that way. I don't know. I, it's nothing purposeful for me. It's the same way people talk about the perfect third. I don't, I don't even consider that anything. Um, I put the, put the picture, put the people in the, ca in the camera the way it looks the most effective to me. Um, I, uh, you know, photography is the art of exclusion. You have the whole world in your viewfinder. What do you, what do you decide to select to be in the viewfinder? Where do you place your people? Sometimes I place my people on the edge, the third, the middle. Sometimes they don't even get into the, always into the picture. They get a little piece of it because it's the way I'm feeling about what is happening at the time. Are most of my shots full frame? Absolutely. I try not to crop. I crop in the camera. I, I look to the edges of the viewfinder. I like to have a camera where the viewfinder is accurate because with a lot of digital cameras, they're not accurate. So you don't always get exactly what you think. Like if you wanted to go up to the edge of a thing, you shoot it and you find out you got a lot more than you wanted uh, or less. Yes, I do, I do look for full frame. I very, and by the way, if there is a good photographic reason for the picture to be cropped, I always crop in the same format of the, of the picture. So the 35 millimeter format is a certain shape. When I crop, I always, I, you know, if I was in my, in my enlarger, my easel, I leave the easel the same, I just move the enlarger head. Well, we don't do that anymore. <laughs> do I find black and white more effective in street photography? Well, I can, I'll answer that two ways. I find black and white very effective in photography, period. But on the other hand, color has its place. I don't ever knock down color. Uh, one of the worst things a photographer can have is when, is when his client says, would you shoot that in color and black and white? Because he doesn't realize the photographer has to put his color head on and his black and white head on. And they're different things. The, the tonal ranges, you know, sometimes you would take a picture because of the color. You know, rather than uh, black and white, it may not be that interesting. So I, I just vary it, but I, I have an affinity for black and white. Uh, but I will say lately, in this, in this decade, I'm doing a lot more color. The other advantage is that I didn't have before, that we all didn't have before, is that we could decide after the fact to take a color, a color image and make it black and white. And there's a lots of ways of doing it very well. Also, I will say something about, about uh, in, in, fa in, in pro, pro digital. Today, a photographer has many, many more options in the media, the paper. Um, I was very sad when Velour Black stopped being made way back by DuPont. Uh, I used the Oriental for many years, Seagull, the Berita paper. I always used double weight uh, glossy paper, but it, I always, and I always dried it matte. In other words, I'd make the print, I'd wash it, I'd clear it, Maybe I would tone it, selenium tone it, I'd wash it again, and then I would lay it face down on the screens, drying screens, and I would let it dry. I, in other words, it was glossy dried matte. And then when it dried, it usually curled, I would put it between archival boards in a clean, in a cool press. I have an old dry matting press that somebody sold to me a hundred years ago is still working. And today, I saw the prices of a dry mounting press, it's ridiculous. Uh, and they come out flat and they stay that way. So that's why, like for example, there's a wonderful paper called uh, Cansan Barita Photographique. It's a French paper, naturally. Uh, and the first of all, the weight is very good. It's even 
heavier than double weight, but the surface has a wonderful uh, surface very close to the surfaces of, the, of a uh, dried mat. It has a very slight sheen. It doesn't have any stippling in it. It's something to look at and try. Glossy still? What's that? Glossy still? Well, uh, I don't buy the uh, gloss. They have a, the, the, uh, the, the photography comes in one, okay. one uh, surface. Ginkgo, that's right. So the question is, how do I react before I make a picture? What do I do with the subject? Well, it varies. It varies. I don't have it thought out in my head, but there is a, there is a method to my madness. First of all, uh, I see myself in a street as a fly on a wall, uh, so that I'm looking at the, at the image as it's created, as it's being put together, the composition of it and I try to intercept it in a fraction of a second to my liking. If I don't get what I want, one of the advantages of digital photography is, I mean, I think it's almost like cheating. I have a picture that I, one of my bus series, I, I, I'll tell you how I did it. I, I was on the number five bus and I sit on the side seat, you know, by the driver, so I could face other people. And there was a, a fairly young man, probably in his 40s, he had three children with him, three young children, and he was carrying a stroller. And he was sitting in the middle, two kids on one side, one on the other, schlepping this folded up stroller. And the three kids were like sleeping, and it, it looked beautiful. So I took a shot, and I looked at it. There was too much bus movement. So I took another shot. There was still movement. I was ready to give it up. I took one more shot. Perfect, it was perfect. So I went up to the guy, I was ready to leave. I went up to the guy, so you're asking me what I do. I went up to the guy and I said, excuse me, but I just took this picture of you and your family. If you give me your email, send me your email, I will send you a photograph of it. He was very reluctant. I said, why don't I do this? I'll give you my email, send me yours, and you know, so about a week later, I got a, a very cautious email. You know, well, you know, you know. So when I sent him the picture, I gave him really basically a high-res picture. And I said, I'm giving you a high-res picture so that you can reproduce it yourself. It should make a good print. Two days later, I got an email back. That is the most beautiful picture of my family I have ever seen. So what happened was, I put that picture, along with three others, in the Sal Magundi annual non-member show. One picture was selected of the three, that one. Yeah. Uh, two weeks before the show, I get a phone call. Uh, Len Spire, yes. You, you won first prize. Oh, that's great. And uh, you, you also won the... Uh, the Bruce Crane Award. Bruce Crane Memorial Award. I said, that's nice. Are you coming? To, oh, I'll come in. I'll be there, you know, with bells on. So we go to the uh, reception at the Salmagundi Club. Have you been to the Salmagundi Club? It's a very nice uh, uh, kind of a uh, landmark building on Fifth Avenue and 11th Street. Very old fashioned. So they have the show, and now they're going to announce the thing in the club. Inspired wins the first prize, and they give me this little tacky piece of paper. It says, yeah, you know. But clipped to it is something that looks like a check. <laughs> <laughs> the Bruce Crane Memorial Award, 800 smackers. Wow. I almost passed out. I've been kicking around for a million years. I never had that. So here's the funny thing about that. Two or three months later, I get an email from the World Gala Exhibitions, something or other. Uh, Len, since you, since you won at the Selma Gundy Show, you are now uh, uh, eligible to participate in the Buenos Aires Argentina Grand Prize thing. I write to him, I said, is this a, is this a, a fluff? What is this, you know, what is this, a scam? <laughs> oh, they sent me back all kinds of stuff. 
and no, and they also said they had the picture. They sent me the picture that was in his Alma Gundy show, so they had all the information, so it looked legit. So I sent them a file. It was, it was supposed to be in, in, the, uh, in Argentina in uh, February this month. They published a big hardcover catalog. They said, and I, so I said, and it's $40 a book. Well, I'm going to buy one, of course. But I said, well, before I buy it, could I at least see a preview of it? I mean, like, they sent me uh, the, the first pages and the page with my picture on it. So I ordered the book. And just a few days ago, they sent me uh, pictures of the activity at the reception in Buenos Aires and made, went to great pains to show me a wall with my picture on it. So, you know, all from that guy in the bus. Oh. But here is the sad it's thing. I, I called, I sent him an email inviting him to the Selma Gundy show, but I never heard from him, so I don't know. But I have no release from him, but, I, but it's, not, it's not commercial, I don't need a release. If somebody said, oh, we want to use that for Gerber Foods, I'd have to say I have to get a release. But how, uh, you know, to further answer your question, most of the time I don't ask people if I can take their picture before I shoot them. Because if what I see and like, it'll be changed the minute I intervene, so it won't be the same. But as I pointed out earlier, if I think it's pretty iffy, I'll ask permission. And also, a lot of times, you go to help bring your camera up, and people get hysterical. Well, when they get hysterical, I don't photograph. You know, almost, so. Like that woman on the bus with the two kids. She was really close. Yeah, no, no. <coughs> she didn't say anything. You know, the wonderful thing that I found out is that the digital camera, the little ones, is not uh, terrifying to people. Everyone has one. Uh, you know, and even if I pointed, I, I have pictures where I see people are looking right at me, you know, out of the corner of their eye, but they let me take the picture. And actually, sometimes that adds to the picture, the fact that they are peeking at me, you know. Uh, so it's that kind of thing. But I think basically it has to be, you can't have a bad hair day. I mean, the thing is this, if you're feeling down, don't, don't bother. You have to be feeling up to go out and take pictures. And if you do that, things will happen. Things happen. It's amazing how things happen. The serendipityness of the whole thing brings things together. I mean, a lot of, look, you know, I'm, I have to be honest. I'm showing you pictures that I think are some of my better ones. There's a lot of stuff that never gets seen because it didn't work. I'm very hard on myself. I, uh, yeah, but it, it, no, it doesn't say what I wanted to say. We all do that. Uh, you, you know, in the old days when you had a contact sheet and you circled the pictures you're going to print, maybe on a 36-page contact sheet, you printed three pictures. If you printed five, it was a great day. So all those other pictures kind of lay around. Um, if I live long enough, I might go through some of them, because every now and then I find pictures that I didn't bother to print. I think, why did I miss that one? That's a good one. Anything else? Thank you. For more information, please visit us online, give us a call, or stop by our New York City Superstore. You can also connect with us on the web 